Now, if you really want to understand the important origins of the English Bible, as we now know it and have it, then our discussions and lectures from this morning onward will really be necessary to grasp. All that we've said from the Syriac Bible and the Syriac translations uh, right up through our study last week is all in one sense preparatory. Uh, there have been important things all along in that as we have gone along through that, but a lot of this is, is um, uh, doesn't have a big influence on the Bible as we know it and now have it today. But beginning with um, John Wycliffe, who we will begin with this morning, and through Tyndall and these men's associates and, and through the other English Bibles done all the way up until today, uh, that, is the very, that is the most important material. Now, because, these, because important men generally worked on these important translations of the Bible, and therefore, to discuss the translations, we would have to discuss the men. It could easily end up as some instruction in church history as we go along. And I'll try to cover that, and, and sometimes it'll have to be a lot, but I'll try to cover it only so far as it concerns the man's work in English Bible translations and that may need to be prefaced with a little biography of, of the man himself or of some of the events that surround that translation of the Bible. Now we are only, um, what, what dates are we talking about right now? Do you remember? We're going to start with Wycliffe. 1300s, particularly the latter half of the 14th century, which means we are only one and a quarter centuries away from the Reformation. That's how close we are to the Reformation, 125 years, approximately, one and a quarter centuries from the Reformation. Most of what we're going to say concerns, directly concerns the conflicts between the Reformers and the Roman Catholic Church. That's why I say a lot of it will end up being church history. And there'll be takeoffs here and there every now and then, but that's only to better understand the Bible translation, which maybe to do that we would have to better understand some of the context or some of the environment in which it's translated and in which it comes, it comes about. We'll also many times greatly concern ourselves with royalty and nobility in Europe, uh, both in the Isles and on the continent. And that's because of the close relationship between church and state through these centuries. So I'm just giving you a little prelude to what we're going to have to do all the way through, well, all the way through the King James Bible. Conflicts between Reformers and Roman Catholic Church. A lot of church history mixed in with this. A lot of dates and names and peoples and places. And much dealing even with royalty, and by that we mean the kings and queens, nobility, the princes and the lords and so forth, because of the close relationship between church and state during this era which we don't have in the United States today. Now, this morning we start with John Wycliffe. His name, you will see it spelt differently in many different ways. Um, you will see it spelled that way, W-Y-C-L-I-F. You'll see it spelled that way. Just add an E on there, W-Y, I'll give you the the um, most popular spellings of it, W-Y-C-L-I-F-E. You'll see it spelled this way. Ends with a double F, W-Y-C-L-I-F-F. -F. -F. We will spell it this way, W-Y-C-L-I-F-F-E. But I'm sure any of them would be appropriate. But you'll see his name spelt differently. And with pronunciation, you'll, you'll hear it pronounced differently. This Y, that always concerns this Y. Sometimes the long I, Wycliffe, and sometimes the short I, Wycliffe. Now, I was brought up pronouncing it Wycliffe. But in checking that out a little further, it uh, seems to me that Wycliffe is probably the more correct of the pronunciations. So if I may be allowed, I will change my pronunciation that I was brought up with. Those things aren't any big deal, but 
if you can be right, why be wrong? <laughs> so if I call him Wycliffe, then you can snort or something and I'll try to change it to Wycliffe <laughs> because I was brought up the wrong way with that. I had to change some of you folks on Augustine. You were brought up Augustine and the dictionary's first pronunciation is Augustine, so why can't I change if I was brought up Wycliffe, but the dictionary's first pronunciation is Wycliffe. So, <laughs> Wycliffe. A little biography. He was born in the year 1329 in Yorkshire, England. Probably you won't be able to write too much more of this, so I'll turn it off. I can turn it on later if we need it again. And Wycliffe rose to be one of the most brilliant scholars of his day. He became the chaplain to the king of England in 1366. We will find this happening with many men. <coughs> and he received his doctorate in theology from Oxford in 1372. Now I'll give you another tidbit for free. You may not want it, but I'll give it to you anyway. In this country, if it, there's a difference between American and British schools, quite a bit of difference. In this country, a doctorate in theology is written like this, a THD. If you come from a British school like um, Australia, South Africa, England, uh, it's written like this. <coughs> so, this is what he received, in other words. He received a DTH which I guess makes more sense to me because what it stands for is a doctorate in theology. So at least you have it in order, a DTH instead of a theology doctorate, a THD. But anyway, he received a DTH, a doctorate of theology in 1372 from Oxford and he taught at Oxford for a number of years until he was forced out by the Roman Catholics. And we're gonna look some at at, um, maybe let me just start off reading your paragraph from another man's book. You listen to this and I'll, I'll comment a lot about this and some other things. Um, remember we're one and a quarter centuries from the Reformation now. I, I realize some of you probably don't even know much about what the Reformation was, but it's what brought about the religious world that we have and that we know today, the Protestant religious world. Prior to that it was the Roman Catholic world. And that, of course, takes place basically with Martin Luther and some of his colleagues, but, but particularly Martin Luther. H however, just over a hundred years prior to this, uh, we have some inklings that are leading us in this direction, though. And these take place under this man, uh, John Wycliffe. Now listen to what this author had to say about him. Wycliffe set himself to rethink the whole question of the basis of society. I mean, he was a brilliant scholar with special reference to the status of the church. The organization of the church as a feudal hierarchy seemed to him to be a great mistake, as also did the rich endowments which it enjoyed, a condition of affairs for which he could find no New Testament precedent. You've heard of, you know, feudal lords and serfs and vassals and kings, you know, in, in the Middle Ages in England and so forth. And and what has happened here is the church, because it lives in that culture, has just adopted that structure, the feudal hierarchy, to incorporate into its midst. And Wycliffe has found a lot of fault with that. Basically, he says, because there's no New Testament precedent for that. Wycliffe, this was his position, Wycliffe propounded the theory of dominion by grace, according to which each man was God's direct tenant in chief, immediately responsible to God, and immediately responsible to obey his law. By God's law, Wycliffe meant not canon law, which he repudiated, Roman Catholic canon law, but the Bible. The Bible was to him the rule of faith and practice, including ecclesiastical practice, and this was a revolutionary idea of his day. For he did not conceive that the Bible's guidance on questions of church order and organization could be ambiguous. I'm basically reading you this because of the first and the last sentence of this paragraph. The first one again. Wycliffe set himself to rethink the whole question of the basis of society with special reference to the status of the church. 
He did not concede last sentence that the Bible's guidance on questions of church order and organization could be ambiguous. In other words, he was one of those who felt that the truth was knowable. And that's the problem of today. Um, you know, we have all these forms of, of government. We have Episcopal government. We have Congregational government. We have Roman Catholic government. We have uh, Presbyterian government. Um, we have no government. Uh, we have all types of different forms. And basically, people say, it's because the New Testament's not clear on this. Well, Wycliffe felt that it was. He said uh, something as important as the organization and the structure and the nature of the Christian church could simply not be ambiguous in the New Testament because that's what the New Testament is about, the founding of the church. And so how could its, its very foundation, its structure, its organization be ambiguous? Well, that's what the New Testament's all about. And we would tend to agree with, with that assessment, although a lot of people wouldn't today. He, as he observed the church, as this author has said, he, he's, he's sorting out um, the whole basis for society. And as he observed the church of his day, he became more and more critical of various aspects of it. Now, he was a Roman Catholic, of course. And all of the reformers began as Roman Catholics. They were born into Roman Catholic families. All of these guys were. So it wasn't like they were born with a reforming silver spoon in their mouth or something, or that their parents forced them into these Reformation-type beliefs. They were born into the Roman Catholic Church. And by their own independent critical thinking, by examining the precepts and practices of the dominating Roman Catholic Church with those set out in the Bible, and particularly in the New Testament, and even more so in the Pauline epistles, they just saw they didn't square that the Roman Catholic Church and what it teaches cannot be supported by Scripture. And so either, either we're going to have to be dishonest with ourselves and our own conscience. And this is what adversaries of people like Wycliffe or ourselves should, should be humane enough to realize. Either we're going to be dishonest with ourselves and to our own conscience and just go ahead and do it because everyone else is doing it, even though we don't feel it can be supported in Scripture, or we're going to have to revolt. And people don't like people who revolt. But they should be humane enough to realize that as human beings, we can't go against our conscience. If your conscience is telling you Roman Catholic doctrine is the way to go, then go. There's no sense in getting out until you've got your own mind, your own will changed about the whole thing. But for those of us who do have our minds and will changed about it, it'd be hypocrisy for us to remain. He was critical in the first place of the wealth of the church. He was critical in the second place of the civil authority of the clergy. Now listen to that, the civil authority. We know they have a religious authority, but the civil authority of the church. You see, the clerical leaders were also friends of kings and friends of queens and controlled whole territories and everything. And Wycliffe was opposed to this. And thirdly, the more, what he said was the moral degeneracy of the Roman Catholic Church in general, which is a broad uh, phrase of protest, I guess. The moral degeneracy of the Roman Catholic Church in general. Now, regardless of whether we're Protestants or Roman Catholics, if we're going to be any type of honest students of history, we would have to investigate claims of a man like Wycliffe here. Wealth of the church, all right? It, it was either wealthy or not. Now, whether we think that's a, a positive or negative, that would be another matter. Civil authority of the clergy. They either held civil positions or they didn't. And again, whether that's a positive or negative would be up for grabs. The moral degeneracy of the Roman Catholic Church, um, if that is true, then I can't say about that what I said about the other two. Well, it'd be a discussion, you know, six, one, half a dozen, whether it's a positive or a negative. Moral degeneracy means it's negative. If you've got moral, morally degenerate priests and bishops, and what he means by that was, was corrupt, um, greedy, corrupt with money, uh, just sex, everything. And he said, how can I continue to participate in something like that? Well, I'm sure someone of his day would say, like those of our day have said to us, well, why don't you stay in there and change it? Well, he was smart enough to realize that couldn't happen. I mean, here he is, a professor of theology at Oxford, an important university of his day. If anyone had a prestigious position which should have been able to change something, it would have been Wycliffe and, and Martin Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and Huston and all the rest of them. But that obviously is just not the nature of reality or not the nature of the case. You cannot stay in there and change 
um, a machine, a society of hundreds of thousands and today hundreds of millions of people. A person is rather foolish to think that way. Now, he particularly had problems with the Pope. Well, the, the buck landed and stopped right there. He detested the fact that the Pope was exempt from taxation. And the Pope derived more money from England than any other part of Christendom. Larger revenues in religious taxation were siphoned out of England than any other part of Roman Catholic Christendom. And so to oppose the Pope, uh, he sided with the English Parliament in desiring to tax the papacy through the cardinals and bishops locally residing in England. You couldn't actually reach the Pope. He lives down in Rome. So with the English par Parliament, um, he sided with their desire to tax the papacy through the cardinals and through the bishops. Now, not only was he so negatively oriented, you know, so um, against the Roman Catholic Church, but we could say maybe more on a positive side that he was concerned uh, over the great spiritual biblical blindness uh, in which the people were held because they were kept captive by the priests, by the Roman Catholic priests. And so you've heard of Martin Luther's 95 Theses tacked to the door of Wittenberg Chapel. Well, in 1377, Wycliffe issued his 19 articles. Martin Luther had his 95 Theses. Wycliffe had his 19 articles issued in 1377, which were critical of the Roman Catholic precepts and practices. And for this, the 19 articles issued against the Roman Catholic Church, the Pope turned around and issued five bulls against him. So he said, now just take that. You gave me 19 articles, but I gave you five bulls. Up. Well, um, Wycliffe's popularity began to go down somewhat. However, he had important religious friends who remained on his side at Oxford. They admired his strong stand for the truth, even though they were of the opposite opinion. They were still in the Roman Catholic hierarchy. His friends really stayed with him up until somewhere between 1380 and 1382, where Wycliffe first of all challenged and then denied the doctrine of transubstantiation. <coughs> We're just looking at a biography here of Wycliffe's life. And again, you can learn things about your own life, your own stand on religious matters when you study someone like this. Who lived, a long, who lived as long ago as he did, and yet who challenged some of the very things that, that we challenge in the church of our day. He had friends who admired him for a strong stand, even though they weren't of his opinion or his persuasion. But when it came to the doctrine of transubstantiation, that meant your life or death in the church, spiritually from the Roman Catholic point of view. And so he challenged that. You know, I don't think I can find this in Scripture. And if you would have been living um, under or studying under Wycliffe during this period, um, and, as a man like this comes to these positions, you know, you hear him challenging things. So he hasn't denied it yet. He's just wrestling with the whole thing. I mean, to throw out transubstantiation when you've been brought up a Roman Catholic and just, you don't just say, you don't just wake up Monday morning, well, I think that's a false doctrine. You start investigating and scratching your head and kind of sounding a little negative about that. Well, I wonder about this. And maybe your pupils are wondering along with you about that. Hopefully he had some who were, and we know that later he did. And then he finally comes to the point of just throwing it out. He denies the doctrine of transubstantiation. All this then caused him to be relieved of his teaching duties at Oxford. I think we call that he was fired. 1382. 18 months later, he died of a stroke on December the 31st, 1384. December the 31st, 1384, at his home. And he was buried in the local church graveyard. Now those last few months of his life, those last 18 months of his life were not bad. Don't get from what I've just said the picture that, oh, he was so despondent over being relieved of his teaching duties at Oxford that 
um, he just passed into senility and then went ahead and died or something. No, he was happy, but he died of a stroke, nevertheless. I guess you can die happy of a stroke on December the 31st, 1384. Roman Catholics pronounced him a heretic. He had been their most brilliant scholar in Oxford prior to this. But, but friends can become enemies. They burned all of his books publicly at the Council of Constance in the year 1415. He burned his books at the Council of Constance in 1415. And then listen to this. In the year 1428, his bones were exhumed and they were burned and they were thrown into the Swift River which peacefully ran through this local village in England. So little remains of Wycliffe today. Ashes uh, somewhere in the North Atlantic, probably. 1428, his bones were exhumed, they were bur burned, the ashes were thrown into the Swift River by the Roman Catholics. That's a naughty thing to do to somebody. Well, can you imagine stooping to that? They're really practicing that precept of love your enemies, right? I mean, they hate the, they hate the man so much he's dead and gone. He's been gone, what, uh, more than a quarter of a century now. And they're still so irritated with him that they bring the man back from his grave. I mean, le at least leave his bones in peace there. How despicable. I think maybe his evaluation of Roman Catholic moral degeneracy was probably correct. I mean, anyone who would do something like this, exhume someone's bones a quarter of a century later, and just for sheer spite, of course, they think he's in hell burning, you know, but just for sheer spite, then to burn his bones into ashes and throw them into the Swift River. Just remarkable. But, um, lest someone think that's all the story, Wycliffe was involved in his own uh, idiosyncrasies, as well as too many of the reformers, and, oh, I don't know. I guess some of that can be explained on the basis of the times in which they lived, but that in no way makes them any less guilty, though, of um, actually rejoicing over other people's deaths as well. I think that Wycliffe and some of his associates, some of his associates did, and whether he was involved, uh, I don't know for certain. I don't know if anyone knows for certain, but anyway, that's enough of the biography of, of Wycliffe. Um, Let's move on to something else. We're not actually going to get to this work this morning, or very little of it. Uh, but let me describe some of the religious and cultural things happening during this period. The period of great transition. It was a period of transition from the Middle Ages to the Reformation era. And there's quite a difference between the two as you go from the Middle Ages to the Reformation era. It was characterized by, a, by several very important events. Some of these you may be familiar with already. These are some of the important um, spiritual and cultural events that saw the bridge being formed as transition from the Middle Ages to the Reformation. The first of those was the Black Death. I'll give them to you more or less in chronological order. The Black Death. Now, do you remember from high school what that was? It was the plague, the bubonic plague. It struck Europe in 1350, decimated Europe's population. It killed one-fourth of the people living on the continent of Europe, including England. It killed one-fourth of the people. Of course, there were a few um, apocalyptic readers of that day who just were sure the book of Revelation was upon them. But a fourth of the world, the known world's, important known worlds, populations decimated with just within just a sh very, very sh a matter of years, a very short period of time. Uh, surely this has to be the book of Revelation in fulfillment. Evidently it wasn't, because that was about 600 years ago. But it was a terrible plague. Bubonic plague still exists in the world today, by the way. But, um, of course, it was carried by rats, and we have... Um, in most parts of the civilized world, we have um, laws, <laughs> we're supposed to anyway, they're not always enforced, that keep Oscar the seven-foot rat out of the neighborhood. <laughs> when, you, when you got rats like that, I mean, 
When you just throw your garbage and your sewage out beside the street, that's, that's what caused these, these rats to come in, and they were already carrying the bubonic plague and killed a fourth of Europe's population. So um, Wycliffe was alive then, remember. Geoffrey Chaucer was writing Canterbury Tales around this same time. And so if you know that, then you look into their writings and see is it reflected there? Are some of these events reflected in their writings? And by the way, Wycliffe did a lot of writing not just translating the Bible, but he did a lot of other writing. So there's one of the, that's probably the most important, well, yeah, I would say the most important cultural event in all of, social cultural event in all of Europe during this time, the Black Death of 1350. Then to get on the religious side, uh, number two, another important thing taking place here. I just want you to know this because in knowing this, you know the setting, is the Babylonian captivity of the papacy what we call the Babylonian captivity of the papacy that lasted from 1309 to 1378. Now, who remembers what that was? Babylonian captivity of the papacy. You ever heard of that phrase before? What do those dates look like? So it looks like 70 years. That must have been how it got its name then. The Israel was in Babylon for seven years, about seven years, 1309 to 1378. Babylonian captivity of the papacy. Well, it was when the papal court was moved from Rome to Avignon, France. A-V-I-G-N-O-N, Avignon. <coughs> and here the popes, who ruled during this period from 1309 to 1378 under the direct domination of the French kings who were the hereditary enemies of the English royalty. Now, this is an important time for Roman Catholic history and we'll discuss this in a lot of detail of what caused it and everything and what brought about its reversal whenever we study church history sometimes. But you should be familiar with that term anyway, the Babylonian captivity of the papacy. Papal courts moved from Rome to Avignon in France. Then the third great thing is the great schism, which is really part, almost part of the Babylonian captivity. The great schism. That's just what it's referred to as, the great schism, which lasted for the next 40 years, from 1378 to 1417. When during this period there were two rival popes, one back in Rome and one over here in Avignon, France. And so there were many bickerings and fights taking place during this time. Two rival popes, one in Rome and the other one in Avignon. <coughs> And then a fourth thing, that you could just spend, let me tell you, a long time on each one of these. These are very important events. You know, like Industrial Revolution, all of this, it kind of brought us from the Reformation era up into modern times, and the Age of Enlightenment, and the writings of Kant, and Immanuel Kant, and the writings of Hegel, and people like that. Those were transitional things that brought us into the modern era here. Well, these were transitional things that took the people from the Middle Ages up into the Reformation. Black Death, Babylonian captivity of the papacy, the Great Schism, and the Peasants' Revolt. This particularly has to do with England now, the Peasants' Revolt. The other things have to do with really the whole of the world or the whole of Europe. And numbers two and three, particularly religious, ecclesiastical Europe. The Peasants' Revolt of 1381. Notice the date. It's a year before Wycliffe dies. Wycliffe's years are from 1329 to 1382. Or 1384, rather. It's three years prior to his death. I'm thinking of it's a year prior to some of the important translating work that was done in 1382. Now, the Peasants' Revolt was just that, a revolt of the peasants. Now, the, the adversaries and enemies of Wycliffe blamed this on him. <laughs> uh, he was not directly responsible for this. But probably because some of his work, much of his work, well, all of his work had to do with writings against the leaders and in favor of the common man, the poor people that it somehow uh, lifted the aspirations and thoughts of the peasants and caused them to revolt in England. And there was a lot of bloodshed over this. 
There was something like this happened during the time of Martin Luther as well. Uh, something like this happened also in the, um, um, the French Revolution, the end of the 18th century, during the time of Robespierre and uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. But, of course, he's blamed for this. And during the same time, he's, he's challenging and denying the doctrine of transubstantiation. And he's being relieved of his teaching duties at Oxford. So he's got a lot going against him. His enemies are saying, you know, you've given up the faith and you're a militant leader of peasant folk because now with your writings, you've inspired these folks to try to overthrow the government and so forth. So these are some of the great things that are taking place here. Now, Wycliffe is referred to as the, the morning star of the Reformation. You'll find that in all church history books. I don't know who coined that term, but I'm just borrowing it because it's found in many church history books. Wycliffe is referred to as the morning star of the Reformation. Now, what's the morning star? Let's start with morning star, and then we'll deal with Reformation. What's the morning star? What? Okay, what, what is that? It's really not a star, is it? It's a planet. What planet is it? It's Venus. Yes, Venus is the morning star. It, it's, it's, the, it's the last star that you see certain times of the year, certain parts of the globe, before the sunrise in the morning. So in other words, it signifies a new day. Hence the name Morning Star of the Reformation. Something that signifies a new day. All right, That's why they called him Morning Star. He wasn't the sun. The sun was Luther. was Martin Luther, the German monk and Roman Catholic priest turned Protestant reformer. That was the sun whenever he rose in all of his strength and might and power. But someone who, who foreshadowed him <coughs> and more or less was a harbinger that predicted his, his coming or the coming of the Reformation was the Morning Star Wycliffe. Now, Morning Star of the Reformation. Let's look at the second part of this phrase then. Why Morning Star of the Reformation? Not Morning Star of something else. Morning Star of the Reformation. Well, it's because of his close ties with Reformation doctrine. It was because of his insistence upon, uh, number one, the fact that many Romish doctrines were contrary to Scripture. He insisted that many Romish doctrines were contrary to Scripture. Now, which, which Romish doctrines do you think he had in mind? Transubstantiation was one. Clerical infallibility was another. Purgatory and so forth. You see, long before the First Vatican Council of what was that, 1870, I believe, the dogma of papal infallibility was stated. <clears throat> Long before that, there were hints of this in the Roman Catholic Church during history. So one of the things he opposed was clerical infallibility. Just because you're a priest, a man of God, doesn't make you infallible. He saw the dangers that, that brought into the church. He saw positive things that would come as a result of denying that. And so... Traditionally, Roman Catholics have held to clerical, at least Pope, as high up as the clergy goes, infallibility, and historically and traditionally, Protestants have denied clerical infallibility. But um, all of these things are things that we do need to think about. Clerical infallibility, uh, purgatory. I mean, there are, some, there are some interesting verses in the Bible that people try to use for something like purgatory. And secondly, he insisted upon only scripture being the binding authority upon men, not the rules and the doctrines and the commandments of ecclesiastical leaders. He insisted that scripture only, and only scripture, should be the binding authority on men's lives. He said the priests were to be servants to the people of truth, and not dictators, and that immoral. That the true calling of the minister is to serve and not to dominate. But he had everything to lose to say that because he was a religious leader. If he thought that 
that would really be losing anything in the final analysis, which of course he didn't. He said, according to Mark chapter 10, Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, uh, verse 45, Mark 10, 45, and to give his life a ransom for many. And of course, we know there are many scriptures that would support that teaching. <clears throat> but there's probably one of the best ones because the disciples are arguing um, amongst themselves who's going to be the greatest. And the outcome is the greatest will be the least. So that's the way the Gentiles exercise dominion and lordship. But so it shall not be among you. And so Wycliffe, I mean, Wycliffe, to, to us it seems, well, that's obvious. I mean, those things are obvious, but this is revolutionary for someone to think this way during this period of time. It's revolutionary to think that, that the clergy should not have this type of position th that they traditionally had. And it's revolutionary for him to look into the Bible and say, well, here's the simple, plain teaching of the Gospels. The Gospel of Mark, specifically, in the 10th chapter, in the 45th verse. Here's the plain, clear teaching of the Gospel. How can we look at this and just deny this and call ourselves Christians? and practice some other form of church government or hierarchy. And he was right in what he had to say. And I think probably this last point I've just given you was, was perhaps his greatest insight. Um, and, and that was what dictated the other things that he threw out of his former beliefs. How would you throw out something like clerical infallibility or transubstantiation or purgatory unless you've got some basis on which to do that? So I think probably his greatest sight was the fact that the Bible is our final authority. Now, the, the Roman Catholics paid lip service to that um, phrase, but they didn't really practice that. And he wanted to speak it as well as practice it. The Bible is our final authority. We have to find what the scriptures teach. And if no one else is teaching that, we're still bound to teach it anyway. If no one else agrees, we're still bound to obey that anyway. And so he picked these things that the scriptures do not teach that the Roman Catholics do and threw them out. And then he picked certain things that the scriptures do teach that the Roman Catholics didn't and incorporated those into his beliefs. But here's where all of his life and what I've said thus far ties into Bible translation work. If, if, if the Bible is to be the sole authority for man's moral and religious life, he's got to have a Bible that he can read which then introduces the subject of Bible translations. And you see how his whole life then fits together with this one thing that we're talking about this morning, which is Bible translations. If Scripture is going to be the sole authority for life, men have to be a, it has to be available in their tongue for them to read and to obey. I think Wycliffe also saw that the only way to defeat Catholicism, one man couldn't do it. It was too big. The only way to defeat Catholicism was to put the Bible in the hands of the common people, let them read for themselves, and check out Roman Catholic doctrine, which is um, a brilliant strategy to use. One man, a couple of men, a group of scholars can never overthrow something like the Roman Catholic Church. But if you could put a Bible into, everyone, into, the, into the hands of the common men, and let them read, they can check out Roman Catholic doctrine and they'll find out whether it's right or not. And that's exactly what he decided to do. He organized a group of itinerant preachers. Some of these were fellow Oxford scholars who admired him and his work. And he organized them to faithfully spread his teachings and the use of the English Bible. Uh, he was attacked in a sermon at St. Mary's, Oxford, in the summer of 1382, this is the, the year of the height of the heat of what's going on. And for the first time, his followers were called Lollards. That's where they get their name. That was the first time we know, and that's what they've been called ever since then, but they didn't start off with that name, the Lollards, which means which means poor preachers. Uh, and I'll give you some interesting stories about this as we go along here in the next few weeks. But that's exactly what they were. were. They were poor individuals who traveled around. Uh, and, and these weren't, when I say poor now, and when I say itinerant, don't think of illiterate, because they certainly weren't that. Many of these were fellow Oxford scholars, or at least pupils, who had sat under Wycliffe whenever he was a professor of, of theology here at Oxford, and yet they agreed with him and with his beliefs. 
And so he organized them and they travel around, but who's going to really pay much, you know? And so they were poor. It was kind of like a monastic order in one sense, but, you know, it had none of the, um, none of the lines of monasticism, but it was like a monastic order of this group of men who, in, at least in the summer of 1382, became known as the Lollards. And by the way, other preachers, especially up in the lowlands on the, on the um, continent, were referred to as Lollards, not because they were part of Wycliffe's group, but they were the same type of people, poor individuals who traveled around spreading religious doctrine. And of course, they went around spreading right religious doctrine. But here again, one man can't do it. And again, e even if he's got Bibles, he's got to somehow get the Bibles out there for the people, get his teachings out there. So he had a whole army of people that aligned themselves under him. Uh, he began to write even more prolifically toward the end of his life to the point that even his enemies were amazed at his literary production. After his death in 1384, these faithful disciples of his, the Lollards, continued to spread his beliefs. But uh, it is sad to say, and here's kind of the sad note on which we will have to end, that they had very little impact on England. Um, Wycliffe's an important man. He does an important work. And it's sad to say his work um, did not have a, a major important impact upon the people. Persecution of the Lollards set them back in the year 1401. Just 15 years after his death. Uh, but he had some students, former pupils of his at Oxford, who were from Prague. Because people would come from all over Europe, various important European cities such as Prague and Czechoslovakia and attend Oxford University. And he had some pupils who were from Prague, who had studied at Oxford, who had gone back to Prague, and they carried his work back there. And under the man Jan Hus, these ideas and thoughts were really kept alive all the way up into the time of the Reformation. Jan Hus, Czechoslovakian um, man influenced by pupils of Wycliffe who had gone from Prague to Oxford to study under John Wycliffe. Okay, that's all we're going to say this morning, then, about his life and about some of the social and religious and cultural events that are taking place. In the next few weeks, we will look specifically at his translation, several translations, evidently. Um, probably one of those teachings or several, you'd want to have your King James Bible along or, or something like that so we can point out a few things of how the King James Bible has, in very slight ways, been influenced by Wycliffe. But the thing to remember here about Wycliffe is that he is the first significant, important individual who sets in motion all this translation work. I mean, Kedman, he's not nearly as important as John Wycliffe. He did something way back whenever, you know. And what was it but metrical paraphrases anyway? For the first time now, and all we've talked about anyway are partial translations, remember. For the first time, we're going to get an entire, a complete Bible here. And Wycliffe's Bible doesn't influence that many people and his doctrines and his preaching and, and the Lollards under him don't influence that many people in England. It really doesn't change very much. But still, when we look back in history, we trace all this back to him. He's the first one. I think William Tyndall, who's the man who comes right after Wycliffe, is probably the greatest translator that the English Bible has ever had. And, and I'll say why then. But Wycliffe, he could be called the greatest in the sense that he was the first not in the sense that his work was perhaps as significant as someone like William Tyndall.